Okay, so we have a lot of questions here this morning. So we're going to just start going right into the questions. Uh, let's see, a total number right now, we have about 21 questions. So we'll get started right here. Our first question is from a board member. If all members of the board and the finance committee, total of 11 of our condo HOA, attend a presentation by an investment advisor, would this be considered an open meeting, even though no decisions or actions will take place at this time? So short answer on this would be yes. If you have a quorum of the board meeting to discuss association business, it's considered a board meeting. You would need to notice it. Um, you know, one thing that you could do would be have less than a quorum attend the meeting to get around the open meeting law. Um, you know, or you could um, just say that the presentation is going to be given and you know, the board isn't going to ask any questions or have any dialogue between themselves. Um, why not make it an open board meeting, you know, and have it on Zoom? Um, you know, I don't see any harm in that. And that's really the intent of the open meeting law. So I do think it would be considered an open meeting. Um, the other question on that that went along with this is perhaps a future board action if investment strategy changes. Um, you know, anytime you're changing your investment strategy, it would have to be done in an open board meeting. And remember, no high-risk investments ever should be made for an association on your association's funds. Okay, next question. Did I hear correctly from an earlier class that if we do not have a quorum for the annual meeting, the meeting is put off until the next annual meeting and that everything stays status quo? Or do we have to go out and try to solicit mail-in ballots to or absentee ballots to reach a quorum? Okay, one thing I want to mention. So a couple things. The question said, can we solicit proxies to reach a quorum? So remember, under Arizona law, we no longer use proxies unless you're under developer control or de declarant control. Now we use absentee or mail-in ballots to try to get people who can't attend in person to vote by absentee or mail-in ballot. Uh, okay, so you want just reaffirmation that, okay, if you don't have a quorum at your annual meeting, um, what happens? So basically, if you don't have a quorum at your annual meeting, I recommend that you try again. We reschedule the meeting. You may have a reduced quorum rate if your CCNRs or your bylaws allow for that, and it may be easier to get a quorum at that point. Um, if you try again to get a quorum for a second attempt at the annual meeting and you don't get it, um, then typically what happens is the board members that are current, the current board members, they continue on until the next annual meeting. And, um, you know, everything, like you said, kind of stays the same. Um, you know, sometimes a board member wants to get off at that point, um, and maybe what they do is resign, and then maybe the board appoints a replacement for that person. That can happen. Um, okay, so next question. Is it legal for an HOA to require homeowners to purchase house paint from a specific paint company? So really good question. So your association, it sounds like, has come up with approved paint colors. And, um, you know, they're maybe using a company that maybe came out with a more color palette. And, you know, maybe let's say, for example, it's Dunn Edwards, and they gave you five Dunn Edwards colors that are approved. Um, you know, I think, here's what I would recommend. Most paint companies can match paints and so I think a reasonable approach on this would be, um, you know, if they can, if another paint company can match the same paint color, the same, you know, UV or whatever they call it, the reflection rate. If everything is exactly the same, it can be matched. Bring it to your board, let them know that, get them to approve that you want to use you know, this to write paint company. Um, and, you know, so is it legal to make them purchase house paint from a specific paint company? I, mean, I know it's been done because it's helpful to tell people which paint you know, colors are approved in the color palette. Um, but I feel like if another owner came to the board and was able to match like with like, exactly like with like, I think the board should allow to have that other paint company be used as long as the colors match like for like. Okay, next question um, from a board member. Is ARS Title 10, Section 3824, to requires a director's dissent entered into the minutes of the meeting. In addition, the National Council for Nonprofits, a trade association representing nonprofits, states in its sample code of conduct 
All conflicts disclosed to the board will be made a matter of record in the minutes of the meeting in which the disclosure was made. The board of my HOA does not report any dissension or conflicts in its minutes, only a nay vote. To me, when there is a major conflict in the minutes, the secretary should provide a brief discussion of the dispute. When there is a major dispute on a motion, what specifically should the board report in the board minutes? And if the minutes do not report a dispute, what action should a dissenting board member take? Okay, lots of questions in there. Um, okay, a couple things. You know, the meeting minutes for uh, the section that you're quoting is in the, I believe it is in the Nonprofit Corporation Act, although I, because I'm just looking at this question for the first time, I don't know for sure. Um, I think the best way to handle this is the board doesn't have to, under the law, um, you know, state, you know, discussion, lengthy discussion of why somebody's opposed to something. If a director asks to have their name listed as dissenting to whatever is being voted on, I think the board should, you know, state, you know, Susie Kier asked to have the record reflect in the minutes that she voted against this. That's fine. I think the board should do that if that happens. Um, if the board member feels very strongly about this and wants something, you know, more put in there, then I suggest that they just write an email or a letter to the board and ask to have, you know, that place with the association's record so that there's a record or detailed record of why they're opposed to this. Okay, next question, number five. Current status of the Corporate Transparency Act as it pertains to associations. Well, that's probably the million dollar question right now, right? <laughs> okay, so quick little update on this. We talked last month about the Corporate Transparency Act. And um, as for some of you, quick 411 is that the federal government passed a law that um, is went into effect January 1st, 2024. And it says basically that by January 1st, 2025, all corporations that fall under a certain category, which associations typically will fall under this category, just, you know, as nonprofit corporations in Arizona, you will have to do this. Um it states that we have to provide certain information to the federal government. So the names of the board members, some personal identifiers of the board members, like their social security number or their um, driver's license number. And we have to provide that every time there's a change in the board so that the federal government can keep track of who's serving on these boards. Um, it's overreach, in my opinion, by our federal government to be doing this. Uh, and so there was a case that was recently decided um, in a different jurisdiction, not in Arizona, um, or a group of corporations that you know, were opposed to the Corporate Transparency Act. It, it was uh, appealed, and it was determined by a judge that um, the Corporate Transparency Act is unconstitutional. Now, there's a lot of discussion about what does this mean? There's a case, and I can't remember where it was, somewhere like in Kentucky or something, that says that it's unconstitutional. What does that mean for HOAs in Arizona and, and you know other parts of the country? Well, it's instructive. That's what I'll say. One court has said this is unconstitutional. And I think it's kind of like the first shoe to drop. I am not saying here that Arizona HOAs you know, can just blow off this January 1st, 2025 deadline that we have because... You know, this hasn't been ruled unconstitutional for every, you know, buddy. It's just been screwed up that sued on it. But it's it's the shoe dropped, right? So a court has now said this is unconstitutional. There's going to be a flood of a whole bunch of other cases where other entities are going to file lawsuits saying this is unconstitutional. I don't know how those judges are going to rule. Um, but I do think it's overreaching, like I said. And I do think that we got to keep an eye on this over the next no months eight or nine months. And if I had to, if I were a betting person, you know, I, I think probably that we're not going to have to comply with this, but we're not there yet, right? The first shoe dropped. We got to wait for a couple more shoes to drop here before we can say, um, you know, this is not something that we have to comply with. Another thing that could happen is that the legislature could overturn this, you know, and say this doesn't apply to HRAs and condos. So it's, everything's kind of in a state of flux on this right now on the Corporate Transparency Act. And my best advice is our firm's keeping an eye on it. Okay, we're going to be reporting to you 
you know, leading up to the January 1st, 2025 deadline, we're going to be talking about this issue a lot. And we're going to be providing you with feedback as we get closer and closer to the deadline as to whether or not you need to comply with it. So stay tuned would be what I would say. Okay, next question, number six. What exactly is the treasurer's responsibilities for given that our management company prepares financial statements for board approval and they become part of the official record? Okay, so we're going to be sharing with you a cheat sheet that we have on board member roles and responsibilities. And on the flip side, we have like the treasurer's responsibilities that you should take a quick peek at. Um, also, I would recommend that you look at your bylaws for your association. The bylaws typically have a section in there that says what the treasurer's responsibilities are. Um, lastly, just in my experience, because I've served as treasurer of my association, the treasurer for your association has a heightened responsibility to carefully review the bank statements, the financial statement, the year-to-date budget, to be a part of the budgeting process, you know, in the summer months or the fall months leading up to the next fiscal year. You have, the, you're the one, the buck stops with you. And so, you know, I served as a treasurer for my association for two years, maybe. And I had to really carefully look at that board packet before we walked into the board meeting. And I had to, you know, provide a summary of what the current financial state was of our community every month. And I was carefully checking because let me tell you, I didn't want to have fraud or embezzlement on my watch when I was the treasurer. So I was very, very careful. I probably spent maybe an hour before the board meetings, maybe a little less, 40 minutes to an hour, carefully looking through everything to make sure that, you know, none of those warning signs that we talked about here today were present. Um, so I think that's kind of a good summary for you. And just because the board's looking at this, that's not enough. If you're the treasurer, there's a heightened level that you have to be looking at this much more carefully than other board members. Question seven, our bylaws require the board to have five members. A director recently resigned, leaving us with four directors. We are a small community. And despite an aggressive search, we have been unable to find a volunteer to join the board. One community member is now arguing that the board cannot act without the fifth director. Is that true? No, that's not true. I mean, in a perfect world, you could find another person to be that fifth director. And you should keep looking for somebody. Uh, you know, keep sending out notices, keep talking about it at the board meetings, that if anybody's willing to serve, we'd love to have you, we need somebody to help us. Um, but really, if you have a five-member board, a quorum is three, and so you have four. So as long as three directors are showing up for every meeting, that's a quorum. So, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, have that fifth director if you can't find anybody. I mean, of course, the best case scenario would be that your bylaws say you have to have five, you have five, but things happen where you can't get people. Now, if you're going down to three or two directors, you can't find anybody to replace them. Then you might want to bring in our firm writes a letter to the community telling them that, hey, if we can't get directors to serve, we have to go into a receivership. And uh, we've helped other associations with that. And, uh, you know, that's a very effective tool to get people to volunteer because nobody wants their community to go into a receivership because it's going to end up costing everybody a whole lot more money. Okay, next question. How do we handle a board member who says he doesn't need to follow the laws? Hmm. Um, bring your attorney in to um, talk with your board about the importance of following the law, number one, and that this is a breach of fiduciary duty and this person could be personally liable for any of the bad decisions that they're making by not following the laws. Um, so I think bringing the attorney in would be a good um, starting point. If the person is just not you know, getting it, then you may want to consider removing the director from office. And there's a specific procedure under state law to do that. Um, number nine, had our annual meeting and board elections this week. Hard copy ballots were sent along with an email with a link to vote online. One candidate decided to pull out after the hard copy ballots and online link were issued. The community manager and board resent a new link with the revised ballot, stating if you voted already, your previous ballot pulled and the new one will be counted. This option was not offered to anyone that returned a hard copy ballot. There are three seats open with four candidates. Final tallies were closed for all the candidates. 
Since those voting using hard copy ballots were not given the same opportunity to recast their ballots, is the election valid or should it be redone? It's a tough question. I mean, I agree with you. This was not handled properly. Um, You know, I think this, this comes up, honestly, a lot in associations where somebody gets sick or spouse gets sick or, and they, they thought they were going to want to be on the board, but now they're not. I mean, if I were advising you on this, I would have given two you know options. I would have said to the board, either you resend everything, cancel the annual meeting, start over, resend a new ballot by mail, you know, to the people that want to do vote hard copy ballot and resend, you know, the, all the links for the emails so that everybody can see who's, you know, voting and, um, redo it, do a redo or don't do a redo and, you know, changing one, but not the other. That's the problematic thing here to me. And so don't, don't resend it. You know, the online ballot should have stayed the same and the, um, the hard copy ballot should have stayed the same. And then if the person who, you know, bowed out got elected, you know, we just announced that they're not, they don't want to be on the board. So the very next person with the highest number of votes would be elected instead of that person. Um, So, you know, your question, does that invalidate the, the election? I don't know how a judge would rule on this. I don't like it. I think it's problematic, but I don't know how a judge would rule on it. Um, possibly, I mean, you never know in litigation, but I don't like how this was handled. Okay. Next question. Number 10, how can a board find trusted advisors when the property manager and the board isn't familiar with follows or enforces the governing documents and gaslights the community members (laughs) saying that everything is fine? Um, that is kind of tickling my funny bone. I'm sorry. It shouldn't be, but it just, it's sad. This is something that happens in our in our industry, right? The property manager is trying to push the board to use their attorney, right? That's a conflict of interest. That shouldn't be happening. The property manager is, you know, telling the board that this homeowner that's raising this issue is crazy or, you know, they they're off on the wrong path when really maybe the homeowner is asking for records. And they're entitled to see them under the law and they're being shut down by, you know, maybe a manager who isn't familiar with the laws or who doesn't want to share documents. Um, So how can the board find trusted advisors? So, you know, these type of classes are great classes in that you're learning about, um, you know, the laws so that you have a knowledge um, and so if you hear something that's not exactly right from your management company, you can say, well, I attended the seminar and here's this cheat sheet. Um, use our website. We have a ton of free information on our website. We have over 60 cheat sheets on many different topics pertaining to associations. We have all of the videos of every class we've taught, um, all there, fingertip away, click away. Um, and you can, you know, show them, Hey, this is what this attorney said. And this person has a lot of expertise has been doing this a quarter of a century. Um, and, you know, reach out to us because we don't align with any management company. So I will tell you exactly what I think on every issue. I not, there's no filter. I just say, this is, I don't agree with this, or I do agree with it or whatever. I'm calling it the way I see it. Okay, next question, number 11. If our association wants to update our bylaws to limit the number of rental units owned by one person, do we also need to amend our CCNRs? So yes, this is something that wouldn't be put in the bylaws. This should be put in the CCNRs. And we have a a great cheat sheet called Amending Association CCNRs and Implementing Rental Restrictions that I want you to take a look at. We're sharing that in the um, chat and also on Facebook Live. Um, a couple of thoughts on this, you know, we want to be careful, you know, I don't know if we actually can limit the number of rentals owned by one person. So we want to kind of talk that through, like, are you targeting one person or are you saying, um, I think what you're saying is you don't want a bunch of, you don't want an investor to buy like seven or something like that. So it's possible we could do something like that. Um, but there needs to be a strategy on that for sure, because, um, you know, you don't want to spend money on an amendment if ultimately it's not going to be enforceable or it's going to be challenged. So I think I would want to look at that a little more carefully. 
Okay, um, number 12, are you aware of associations obtaining large loans? Um, so I would say, yes, I am aware of associations. I have helped associations navigate that process. There are banks that, um, you know, specialize in giving loans to HOAs and condos. So that's something pretty common. Um, there was a question about me personally for my HOA that I'm in. Have we ever obtained a large loan? And the answer is no, we have not turned the loan out. Okay, number 13, is it legal for the HOA budget line items to fund the reserve account, artificially inflating the assessment fee and not reflecting actual operating costs? So I think what you're trying to say here is, so the HOA budget line items um, to fund the reserve account. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that, okay, so on your budget for your association, right? that you have, you know, how all of your expenses are listed for every month. And one of your expenses that your board is listening listing is that you're transferring money from your, you know, your income that's coming in from assessments on a monthly basis. You're taking some money of that, of that percentage probably and putting it into your reserve. And so your point is you think that the board is artificially inflating, um, you know, or make, making up that they have to put money in the reserve and that's making or artificially inflating your assessment fee. Um, truly, I have I, I never have seen that. Um, I've, I've never ever seen an association doing that. Anything I'm, I'm saying to them, you need to put you need to look at your reserve study. And if it says you have to put away five thousand dollars a month to meet your, you know, expenses that you have on these reserve items, you should be doing that. So I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to disagree without having more facts. I, I do not ever see associations artificially inflating how much assessment income they need by using the reserve fund strategically saying, oh, well, we need to put away this amount of money this year in the reserve account. And I mean, I, I've never seen an association have that kind of a messed up strategy that we're going to try to get more money in, um, you know, on our assessment by making up how much money we need to reserve. I truly have never seen that. Okay, uh, next question. Passboards have not earmarked reserve funds for specific projects and continually pull funds for lesser needs. What are the pros and cons for or against earmarked funds? You know, most associations don't have their reserve funds earmarked. You know, they have a reserve study that shows, um, you know, how the money what the needs are for that year. And then the association's board has to make a decision in terms of how do we spend the money that we actually have available to, you know, pay for our reserve funds. So, um, you know, are there pros and cons for earmarking it? I mean, it, yes, you know, but things change too. So the cons are that, you know, things are more expensive than maybe we thought they would be. And then you don't have enough money. Um, maybe a new issue pops up, you know, and, uh, for maintenance type issue that is now a crisis, you know, and so we need to have some flexibility. Um, so I would say most of most of our clients are not earmarking their reserves funds funds to the penny or anything like that. They're, they just know how much money is in their reserve. They're looking at their reserve study and then they're looking at the needs and making the decisions. Question fifteen: Is there a percentage you keep in an account for extra unplanned needs, or is extra money all there to be in a reserve? Okay, really good question. So actually my association, we have about $20,000 a year that we put into kind of like, a, I can't remember what exactly what we call it on the budget, but the basis of it is it's like unexpected expenses. So we have like a $20,000, you know, cushion in case something comes up in the year that we didn't anticipate. So, um, you know, our budget is like, couple million dollars. So it's a very small percentage, but, um, you know, I don't think that there's a bright line rule about, oh, you should keep 10%, you know, as a holdback in case there's something that comes up for unplanned needs. I think most associations don't do that. But I think having looked at our budget carefully, you know, since I've been on the board, it is frustrating. We have something big that comes in that we weren't anticipating. And then, you know, we're struggling to pay for things that, you know, we budgeted for because of that, you know, change. So I like having that little fudge money there to help us um, in case something extra comes in in a year 
that we weren't anticipating. Okay, question 16. If no board members are willing to serve as secretary, can a volunteer association member or resident take notes for the meeting so as not to have the president take notes and have to run the meeting? So yes, of course, um, you know, somebody can volunteer to take the minutes um, and, you know, the board, you know, will approve them at the next regular board meeting. That's totally acceptable. Honestly, it's so easy to take minutes. Um, you know, I when I'm serving on our board and when I would take minutes or when I'm attending a board meeting as legal counsel for an association, I always offer, hey, can I take the minutes for you to give somebody the day out? Um, you know, I just have my laptop open and I just take the agenda and I just put that right in on my laptop and then I just start filling it in. And, it, and I do all right as the meeting's going, so it's no big deal. And when the meeting ends, I maybe spend two minutes cleaning it up and then they're done for the next month. So it's it's not that big of a job, but if, if a resident wants to do that, that's fine. And great, we should be very appreciative that the resident's willing to do that. Okay, question number 17. Looks like we are up to 24 questions. So we have about three, four, five, six, seven, eight questions left. Okay. Our master board posted a 2023 reserve study. The input to the reserve company was not complete. Many of the assets listed in the 2018 study were omitted. How can we convince them to redo the study so it can be an actual planning document? Hmm. I wonder why they, you know, didn't put all the items in the reserve. I think that would be a good starting point. It would be like, why are the components different between the 2018 reserve study and the 2023 reserve study? I think it's a valid question. Um, I would like to hear the answer on that. Um, if they, maybe they, maybe they'll say that, hey, we looked at it more carefully in 2023 and we had stuff in the 2018 budget that was sub-association stuff and not master association stuff. I don't, you know, I don't know, but I think that's a good question to ask. If they come back and say, oh, they missed it, I think it's very plausible to take it back to the reserve company and ask them to update it for free because they should not have missed anything. Okay, next question, number 18. What percentage of association reserve fund target would be considered reasonable and healthy? So lots of times on the reserve study reports, they will tell you, you know, like actually in the report, how they interpret the results. So, I mean, I've read a lot of reserve studies. So I would say that, you know, reasonable to healthy would probably be the 60% to 80% would be a good target if you're in that range that, yeah, you're on the right track. Things are, you know, healthy. Of course, everybody wants to have 100% in their reserve. But I mean, I, I probably only have a handful of associations, a thousand that we work with that has that, you know, 100% reserve. Next question, 19. Assume a small HOA with below market annual dues and assessments, low reserves, and aging infrastructure. A portion of the community is strongly opposed to dues increases. Contractor bidding on major repair placement projects report receiving calls, apparently from residents, actively discouraging their participation. Oh no, this sounds horrible. Is the bidding process subject to disclosure open meeting rules? And two, how can residents be discouraged from direct contact or intervention with contractors? Okay, you guys have some problems, I can tell. Um, so you're a small HOA, you haven't charged enough in your annual dues and assessment, sounds like for years. You have low reserves and your infrastructure is aging. So I'm glad you're here today. This class is meant for you, right? Um, and you have probably, you know, it sounds like your residents and your owners don't want any, they don't want any changes, right? They don't want to deal with the problems. They don't want dues increases to start addressing these issues. And they're even going to the point of contracting vendors that you're potentially going to hire to help you with the aging infrastructure to tell them you don't want to work here type thing. Okay, I think right now you guys really need an intervention in your association. In a situation like this, I would call a community-wide meeting. I'd bring your attorney, your management company, your insurance agent, and you know a structural engineer and have the panel talk about the problems and that we need these different things to um, so that the property values don't go down and for health and safety reasons. 
And we need to get the owners better informed about the consequences that these issues are handled. And maybe think about some alternate means to fund it, because it sounds to me like maybe there's some fear here that, hey, this is going to cost so much money and I won't be able to afford it. So, you know, we may want to talk about different funding mechanisms that, you know, might not make the burden so high on the owners. So it could be potentially taking out a loan or maybe bringing in a bank that can help with HELOCs, um, you know, to help owners who might not be able to pay a special assessment or increases in assessments. Okay, next question. Can you, as a resident, requi- request the bank statements along with the financials? So short answer would be yes, you can. And the association is required to get those to you. Question number 21. As a board member, can I review the ballots after the annual meeting? And how long are we required to keep them? So absolutely, as a board member or even as a homeowner, you're allowed to review the ballots at your annual meeting. That is a book and record of the association. Um, For an annual meeting, I would suggest that you keep them for at least six years in case somebody challenges it. There's a six-year statute of limitations for breach of contract, so I would keep those ballots for at least six years. Question number 22, please provide suggestions for recurrent vandalism issues. Um, Great question. So I have a a great cheat sheet on dealing with safety issues and associations. Basically, it talks about what are some crime prevention, you know, methods for an association. So go to our website, mulcahylawfirm.com, click on our cheat sheets, and um, I think it's like how to prevent a crime, deep crime liability. Preventing Crime and Limiting Liability. Thank you, Morgan, who's in my office here helping me run this today. She's a superstar, as you can see. She knows that right off the top of her head. Um, And so I would recommend that you take a look at that. Um, You know, some of the suggestions that we have in that cheat sheet, and you can do the deep dive reading it, but installing cameras, um, maybe getting a block watch going in your community, um, getting an off-duty police officer to patrol um, you know, these are all some suggestions that could be helpful. I don't know where the vandalism is occurring, if it's at the pool or in the clubhouse or if it's in people's driveways. Um, but that cheat sheet should give you some great tools to help you navigate that problem. Okay, next question, number 23. I like your idea of conducting a survey of homeowners. Do you know of any templates that might suggest the kind of probing questions we might ask? Hmm. Well, the companies that come in and do this um, are, you know, they're pros of this. So the master plan companies, they probably have some templates. Um, You may want to Google search it, like sample aging infrastructure survey or sample master plan survey for, you know, HOAs to see if you could find an idea, you know, of of what types of questions they're asking. Unfortunately, I don't have anything like that in my uh, back pocket to share with you, but that would be some suggestions. Also reach out to the master plan companies. Um, Contact me to get their names of a few that I could give you, and um, they may share something with you. Okay, question number 24. Do most HOAs operate on or with a cash basis budgeting process rather than an accrual? Um, honestly, I don't know that question, but what I would recommend you, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I would recommend to you is talk to your CPA for your association. Hopefully they work with a lot of other HOAs and condos and they should know that answer. I believe it's cash, but I don't, I don't really, this, that's not really where I don't get involved in that part of, um, you know, the HOA's financial side your CPA would. And so I think that's the best person. Okay, last question. How detailed should meeting minutes be, particularly committee reports? So we have a great little summary for you in our cheat sheet called Community Association Board Meetings. Um, On the flip side of that cheat sheet, um, we have a summary that we did on how to take perfectly proper uh, and legal meeting minutes. So I'd encourage you to look at that. How detailed should they be? Not that detailed. I mean, basically, you should have on there who attended, what decisions were made, right? What decisions were made, what decisions failed. Um, You know, it's not what was said. It's mostly what was decided. Okay, that's it for our questions today. Um, We're on great timing. We're at the concluding remarks now. I hope everybody had a great St. Patrick's Day on um, Sunday. 
and hope you have a wonderful Easter or Passover with your families and friends um, this month. I probably I won't see you again before um, that holiday. Um, keep your eyes out for our Mulcahy memo going out on Thursday this week. Um, we're going to be including a survey asking for some feedback um, from you. What topics like do you want to see for our classes for the next six months for uh, Mulcahy Law Farm? Um, and these would be the neighborhood services, virtual HOA academy classes. So if you're not getting our Mulcahy memos, you should be because twice a week we're putting out a memo on an important topic that pertains to HOAs and condominiums, you know, legal aspects of running an HOA or condominium. So if you want to be added, um, you know, please put your name in the chat right now, um, you know, that you'd like to be added. Um, or contact me at bmulcahy at mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, and so it's really important when we send out that um, request for, um, you know, what are some topics you'd like us to see, like, like us to talk about, um, we listen because we're doing our planning right now for June, um, July 1st through December 31st. So we have to come up with five or six good class topics, and we want to hear from you to find out what are the topics you want to hear more about. Um, we're also, uh, want to remind you that we have our next first Friday event will be Friday, uh, April 5th at 9 AM. Um, and that will be coming up very quickly. And remember first Fridays, for those of you who may be joining us the first time today, first Friday is an opportunity for you to have your questions answered for free. Um, it's on the zoom platform and we also broadcast live on Facebook live and you can submit one question and we answer it. Um, during this call, um, uh, during the Zoom call and or the Zoom video conference. And um, if you're not able to attend live with us at nine o'clock on, you know, April 5th, um, you can watch the replay of it on our Facebook live page and get see what the answer to your question is. Um, next, a couple classes we have coming up in April. Um, we have a surprise HOA summit. This is actually going to be in person on Wednesday, April 10th. Um, in the evening from 6 to 10, 6, 6 to 8 p.m. And we're going to be talking about what are the roles and responsibilities of board members. And it's going to be at the Scottsdale HOA Summit. Contact the City of Surprise to register. Um, we also are going to be putting some information on that on the website if we haven't already. Um, another class that we're teaching is um, our virtual HOA and Condo Academy for April. That's going to be on Tuesday, April 16th at 11 a.m., we're going to be talking about navigating stormy wet, stormy waters. So how do we deal with difficult people and difficult situations in HOAs and condos? So difficult owners, difficult board members, difficult vendors. Um, we are going to get the skinny on how to best manage that during that class. So we hope that you can join us for that class, um, which will be our fourth Neighborhood Services Virtual HOA Academy for 2024. So happy Easter to everybody. Happy Passover to everybody. Please enjoy the beautiful Arizona weather um, before it gets too hot. Um, if you're so inclined to do so, we would sure appreciate uh, a review of our law firm on either Google or on uh, Yelp, um, because the feedback that you provide to us on these classes, we share that with the neighborhood services departments from all around the valley. And um, that just shows them that these classes are valuable and that, um, you know, we want to keep them going through 2024 and into 2025. And I think the participation we had today, um, I think we can all agree that, that we have a lot of people interested in these classes. So it helps us to have those reviews to pass on to um, our whole brand services department. So thanks, everybody, for being here today. Have a great rest of the week. Take care.